Well, good afternoon. Uh, good morning to people online in other time zones. And uh, welcome to uh, this uh, event that is uh, celebrating a, a recently published issue of the Oxford Review of Economic Policy. My name is uh, Chris Adam. I'm currently the managing editor of Oxrep. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleagues today, uh, Simon Quinn and Isabel Ruiz, who are going to uh, lead you through this uh, seminar on forced migration. We have a number of presenters uh, here in the room. We have a number online, but I will leave it to uh, Simon and Isabel to navigate through the next hour and a quarter, hour and a half or so of discussion around this issue. This issue of Oxrep was, was published this quarter, um, and it's very much in the best traditions of the Oxford Review of Economic Policy. Oxrep is a slightly unusual journal. Um, it's a, what we call a commissioning only journal in which we, as the editors, go out and commission a set of papers around a particular theme. And this is very, very wide ranging. Uh, this year we've had, or in the recent years, we've had themes on artificial intelligence in the financial sector. We've got um, uh, this issue on uh, forced migration. We had an issue a year ago on the future of capitalism. Uh, we've got a, a couple of upcoming issues on um, the economics of pandemic vaccination and, and one on uh, the cross-border regulation of trade and digital services and in, in climate and environmental services. So the idea of Oxrep is to bring together the best scholars from academia, from the policy world, uh, to contribute papers around a broad theme. Obviously, this one is on forced migration, and we have been extraordinarily lucky to get so many absolutely top-rate scholars and policy practitioners writing for us. Uh, the format for, for this evening is to get um, brief overviews and discussion around some of the themes. You can see the contents list here on the screens in front of you. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a number of people here uh, in the lecture theater leading these uh, mini discussions around the broad parts of this issue. So with that, I'd uh, just like to say thank you for, for joining us and I'll pass over to Isabel to take the floor. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. Uh, we are very excited with this new issue of forced migration, uh, which raises important policy challenges and, and offers evidence on important uh, questions on refugee migration settings. Um, this issue is co-edited with uh, Simon Quinn, who's a professor of economics at, at the Department of Economics here at Oxford, and he's also the deputy director of the Center for the Study of African Economies here at the university. So today's panel will be divided in four parts that correspond broadly uh, to the important questions that we raised in our issue and that have to do with mechanisms and frameworks for the management uh, of forced displacement situations, integration policies, uh, and consequences of in integration, but also uh, how host uh, communities uh, respond uh, to the inflow of refugees and what kind of policies are aimed at smoothing these transitions. Finally, we're gonna focus on the role of policy to encourage resilience uh, among forced migrants and how can we support their return. Um, and we're going to have also, um, a, a, our, our last part is gonna be talking about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, just before we start today in the panel, we have Professor Alex Betts, who's a professor of forced migration and international affairs, and the William Golding Senior Fellow of Politics at Brazenos College. He's uh, the associate head uh, of the Social Sciences Division at the University of Oxford. Alex is a leading scholar in refugee studies and he has served as director of the Refugee Studies Center in many occasions. And I think you're now again uh, director. We have Professor Carlos Vargas Silva, director of the Center of Migration, Policy and Society, COMPASS here at the University of Oxford. He's also a fellow of Kellogg College and he has a joint appointment with COMPASS um, based at the School of um, of anthropology and um, museum ethnography uh, and the Oxford Department of International Development. And we have Dr. Vlad um, Mikenko, who's an associate professor of sustainable urban development here at the university, uh, the Department of Continuing Education and a fellow of St. Peter's College. Uh, they each will introduce uh, different parts of the journal issue, 
uh, with that taking the, the case of Ukraine. So I have the pleasure to introduce the first part, which deals with mechanisms and frameworks. And in here, the first paper in our issue was written by Grant Gordon and Ravi Gudamurthy and draws from the, their experience and knowledge in the field. And they propose a framework and a vision for the humanitarian sector and how the humanitarian sector should look in the next 10 to 20 years. After, after Ravi gives us uh, his highlights of his papers, in our second paper, Alex Teitelboim and Justin Haddad, who's here uh, presenting, uh, we're focused more specifically on mechanisms for improving the management of refugee settlement, and they do so through the lens of market design. Uh, so without further ado, we'll have Ravi uh, giving us some of his insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the title of the paper is Transforming Forced Displacement Response to Innovation, and it tries to do three things. One, um, provide an overview of the trends and context in which innovation um, has grown in the, in the humanitarian sector over the last 10, 20 years. Secondly, set out a vision for what forced displacement response could look like in 10 to 20 years. And then thirdly, provide some recommendations about how to innovation itself. Um, I won't focus on the first element because that's just the context. I'll, I'll focus on the second, which is the vision. And for each aspect of the vision, we articulate what a better system might look like, followed by some of the, the questions and challenges and research questions that need answering. Um, there are four aspects to the vision of how forced displacement could work better. One is a focus on cash. So over the last decade, as you know, cash transfers have grown rapidly. Um, in 2019, 5.6 billion was spent in cash uh, and voucher assistance. That was about 17.9% of total humanitarian assistance, double the amount just three years before. Uh, and I think the question now is, how far could we go? How much can we replace not just food, shelter, NFI spend, but broader health and education spend on cash? I think that's a, an empirical question that still needs answering. There are obviously big challenges in terms of delayed funding, the challenge in identifying recipients, the difficulty in meshing with local social safety nets, um, and the fact that cash is often still delivered through these sectoral silos that often results in quite subscale cash programs. But the vision of being able to have quick and sufficient cash um, at scale it has to be central. The second aspect of the vision is what we call digital aid. And the what we what is, what is envisaged there is that as soon as someone is displaced, they would immediately have access to information about navigating services and the legal environment, a digital wallet, an employment matching service to connect them to the labor market, um, educational software that uh, enables children to learn and health software that enables them to access uh, medical issues, uh, diagnostics. Now, in contrast to cash, where there is obviously a, a very robust evidence base, there is a dearth of high quality research on digitally delivered services. And while there's lots of innovation in each of these different service areas, including in low and middle income countries, we've not really looked at how they can be applied in uh, conflict affected contexts and questions such as the dosage or the balance between face to face services and um, digital ones and what the right dosage and blend can be. Um, the third aspect to the vision is country level compacts. So we've seen the potential of country compacts um, in Lebanon and Jordan and Ethiopia. While the record is pretty mixed, the potential is substantial. Um, in that the basic framework of providing finance and trade access, while countries themselves provide rights to work, learn and access services, provides potentially quite a transformational um, impact for uh, displaced populations. One of the challenges is that they've often cobbled together quite quickly with insufficient understanding of the right interventions in the context and how to gain win-win outcomes. In an ideal end state, we would imagine up-to-date pre-positioned compacts exist um, so that they can be ready to be rolled out once crises unfold, and that there is a, a strong capacity to be able to um, craft these and respond when a crisis occurs. Um, the final aspect, the fourth aspect of the vision is um, innovation in financing. So we know that finance often is highly delayed, um, it often doesn't last the, the, the right duration as donor for sets in and it comes in the wrong kind of shape. Um, there are innovations, particularly in the natural disaster context, to look at risk-based financing, insurance mechanisms that allow more um, 
rapid response um, to, to meet the right level. We think that has some applicability to um, conflict affected contexts. And we'd like to see how those innovations that we've seen in, in natural disasters could be applied in, um, in the displacement um, issue. So that's the vision. The final bit of the paper talks about how the system itself can become more innovative. And the analogy we use is for innovation is one of, innov one of evolution. In any good innovation system, you need to have lots of seeds of innovate seeds being sown, a fitness mechanism to weed out good and bad, and then an amplification mechanism to scale. And based on that framework, we talk a bit about how we can increase the pipeline of innovations through more risk capital, through more um, capturing of the innovations and improvisation that already occurs by frontline actors, but also the, the support of startups. With regard to a stronger fitness mechanism, we talk about um, improving cost benchmarks um, sector by sector. And then with regard to scaling, we talk about the, the importance of scaling funds specifically and a greater focus on implementation, research and scaling. So that's a, a rapid summary of, of the main highlights and I'll leave it there. Thank, thank you, uh, Ravi. That's an excellent summary and a uh, very thought-provoking paper, which we encourage you all to, to read. And now uh, following with um, th this part, we're gonna have Justin talking about his paper with Alex Tatebom. Everyone, this. All right, there we go. Um, hello, everyone. It's an honor to be a part of this issue. Uh, my name is Justin Haddad. I am a first year master's student in economics here at Oxford. So along with Alex Taylor I wrote a paper called Improving Resettlement Insights from Market Design, which attempts to address. So this, this necessitates a conversation about what market design is. So market design. Uh, parameterizes institutional detail when designing for some kind of economic outcome. So a, a common case that we've, we've studied um, is, or that's been done in the past, is kidney exchange in hospitals. Another one is how we can pick the right schools for students to go to. So in this case, the question is, how do we optimize the placement of refugees into new places given some set of traits? So if they want to optimize for their safety or language alignment, where their siblings are, what their preferences may be. So there's two layers of this conversation. There's the local refugee match. So given a refugee is going to a certain country, where should they go within that country? Another is, what countries should the refugees be placed in? And what, what mechanisms do we employ to, to figure out those answers? So let me use an example. Of, so that what this paper does is it looks in hindsight in the past and says, what has this research been? And then it looks to the future and provokes certain research mechanisms that may be useful um, to look at, one of which may be preference satisfaction. How do we take into account what refugees may want in this allocation process? And another may be, what novel mechanisms can we employ? And especially, what mechanisms can we take from other industries? For instance, there's the, um, the cap and trade system we all know about. Um, with carbon, can we use a similar mechanism for how, for how we decide what quotas countries may have? So I mentioned the local refugee match. It's good to start with, let's say, an example, so we can understand what this particular problem looks like. So in the US, for instance, there every year the president sets a number, a quota, the number of refugees that the US is going to accept for the upcoming calendar year. Responsibilities are delegated downward, and it becomes the nine resettlement agencies have 350 affiliates in total who then become responsible for settling, sponsoring these refugees. There's a big question here. How do we decide how to use these quota? There is a set number. How do we optimize what refugees go where? And so with that in mind, um, over the last few years, there's been a lot of research done on what algorithms can be deployed to figure out this question. So one that Alex Tedeboim and co. have worked on in the past is called Annie Moore. It uses a set of different programming mechanisms to optimize these placements. Um, a really interesting stat to keep in mind, uh, when HIAS, the formerly known nominally as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, so they, they resettled, I think, just under 500 refugees in 2017. And if they, and the statistic we have is that um, right around 150 of them were employed after 90 days, which is the binary metric that the U.S. uses. If they had used any more this algorithm that Alex Sittleboim and co-developed, then they would have had right around 200 refugees um, employed. So we have these, the, the, these metrics that say, given we use some kind of stochastic programming mechanism, um, given we have predictions on when refugees may be coming in, 
uh, we, can, we can optimize employment or refugee welfare thereafter. So in this paper, we go through what these mechanisms in the past have looked like, how we can design better algorithms for change, and what it means to analyze refugee welfare. And we touch a bit on refugee preferences, how we analyze country priorities, and what the intersection of those two things resembles. Then there's the international refugee match. I mentioned market design parameterizes institutional detail. We take a deep dive into what the UNHCR does, how it relates to the Dublin um, regulation, what the intersection of that is with, for instance, the UKRS, the UK, uh, the UK resettlement scheme. Um, and generally, we, we conclude that centralization, increasing the size of the market to include more members on both sides, more refugees and more countries, um, we can optimize outcomes for all. To the end of the paper, um, we speak to two future mechanisms for research. One is how we can use different preference eliciting mechanisms. If there's potential, say, to use cardinal preferences instead of ordinal preferences to give refugees a weight, like a, like a relative weight on how much they want to go one place over another. Um, and a corollary to that is how much do we take into account preferences in general? So something Alex Tittleboim has been working um, on at the present is eliciting preferences for resettlement for Ukrainian refugees in the U.S. And so currently analyzing what these um, outcomes may be and if preferences are a proper heuristic for economic welfare. And the other thing to, to analyze is what I mentioned before, quota trading. Is there a way that we can optimize humanitarian benefits, we can optimize uh, refugee welfare, given we, um, we build some kind of matching with transfers mechanism in? And of course, it requires some kind of ethical constraint. We have to design th these things with an eye for humanitarianism. Um, and very importantly, we conclude in this paper that this is a very political issue. And that is our goal. It is our goal and our job to treat these refugees with humanitarianism, with kindness, and to make sure we don't get clouded with theory and data. Thank you. Um, let me just begin by saying a massive congratulations to Isabel and Simon on this fantastic special issue, and also by extension to um, Chris as editor of the journal. Um, most of my work is interdisciplinary and comes from within refugee and forced migration studies. And, and having a special issue like this has massive implications for our subfield, in addition to the obvious implications for economic policy. So just massive congratulations. This is a huge and substantive contribution to the area I work on. And it's a delight to see all the papers come together uh, and to be able to discuss them. Um, what I want to do is be able to introduce to you um, parts two and part three. Um, so part two relates very much to refugees and macroeconomics. Part three is really about host and receiving societies and explaining variation in the degrees of rights they offer, the types of policies they adopt, and the attitudes of host communities. And so I think we're going to flip the order and start with part three and then come back to part two, because we've got three speakers in part three and then one under part two. Um, so we'll hear in this part on labor markets and host communities um, from Jakob. Um, Jakob um, has co-authored his paper with Christian Dustman and Hai Jin Ku, and it's on refugee migration and the labor market, lessons from 40 years of post-arrival policies in Denmark. We'll hear from uh, Maria Jose Urbina, who's going to present her paper with Sandra Rosso on who opposes refugees, Swedish demographics and attitudes towards forcibly displaced populations. But we, before we get there, I just want to say a brief few words about the paper that I've co-authored with my colleague Olivier Sturck on why do states give refugees the right to work. I just want to say something about why this question matters, the background to the paper, the findings and the implications. So what the paper tries to do is answer the question in the title. Why is it that countries, particularly low and middle income countries around the world, that host the majority of the world's refugees, sometimes give refugees the right to work and other related socioeconomic rights, and at other times don't. There's huge variation across states' policies on the right to work. So at one extreme, we have countries like Tanzania and Thailand that deny refugees the right to work in the formal economy. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have countries like Uganda, Colombia, um, Turkey, who have gone quite a significant way to opening up their labor markets in the formal sector to allow refugees the right to work. So what explains that variation? This is a question that really matters for refugees' opportunities. 
Um, and it matters in three ways. Firstly, it matters for refugee rights. So the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees is very significantly focused on socioeconomic rights. There are a large number of rights that are socioeconomic rights, the right to work, freedom of movement, the right to own property, um, to start a business. And yet those rights have historically been really neglected in comparison to civil and political rights. The second reason it matters is for the politics. We know from political science literature, the work of Dirk Bansack and others, that in Europe, for instance, um, public attitudes towards refugees are very affected by the perception of their economic contribution. Um, and that, for Bansack et al, is the overriding public consideration that shapes attitudes towards refugees. The third reason it matters is the well being of refugees. There's a huge literature, including on the psychosocial well being of refugees, that highlights that the opportunity to work is really central to people's sense of subjective well being. Um, so this is a really important question. By way of background, the paper itself takes a series of propositions that I've developed in my own qualitative research and tries to explore them through quantitative analysis of an original data set. So what were those propositions? Well, in my qualitative work, I looked at the East African context and looking at four countries in particular, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, there's huge variation in the right to work. But there's variation across two axes of the right to work. On the one hand, the de jure right to work, the right to work in law, and on the other hand, the de facto right to work, the right to work in practice. And those four countries occupy different quadrants in that two by two. So Uganda offers the right to work at a de jure level and a de facto level. Um, at the opposite end of the spectrum, Tanzania denies refugees the right to work at a de jure and a de facto level. Ethiopia now offers the de jure right to work, but not in practice, not de facto. And Kenya is a little bit the other way around, still with legislation, de jure denying refugees the right to work, but with certain parts of the country, notably to Kana County, moving towards the de facto right to work. And what seemed to be the case in explaining that variation qualitatively was that payoffs at the international level to the capital city and the central government provided by the international community often buy off the right to work in law, create the conditions under which that's possible. But the de facto right to work is often determined at a local level and is subject to incentives for local political actors. So what we did was we tried to construct an original data set looking at refugees de facto and de jure right to work for every country around the world that hosts more than a thousand refugees. And we decided to look particularly at low and middle income hosting countries because they're in a slightly different category from high income um, refugee receiving countries. And within that, in order to code for the de facto and de jure right to work, we work with three different organizations with different types of expertise on refugees who provided us with coding around that aspect. And we built in other variables that we were interested in. In terms of those variables, we work with a series of alternative explanations um, to explain the de jure and de facto right to work. And the three dominant explanations from the wider forced migration literature that explain variation in refugee rights tend to focus on one, norms, the role of law, two, interests, particularly the role that overseas development aid plays as a political lever, and thirdly, identity, the role that ethno-linguistic proximity between the receiving community and the refugee community plays in shaping outcomes. And we also included a series of relevant control variables. Um, what we really wanted to do was explore the difference that local politics plays compared to national politics. And so one of the main um, independent variables we were interested in was the role of decentralization. So we included a focus on decentralization as a variable. What did we find? Well, through OLS regressions, we identified that there was difference in the variables that were statistically significant in being correlated with both the de jure and the de facto right to work. And what we found for the de jure right to work was that international norms uh, were positively um, correlated and statistically significant um, in relation to the right to work, the de jure right to work, and based on a measure that um, my co-author Olivier Sturck um, has developed, um, was the relatively most important factor in explaining variation in the de jure right to work. 
So law mattered de jure. On the de facto side, the most relatively important and statistically significant variable was decentralization. So decentralization is the sort of factor that seems to have a massive influence in explaining the de facto right to work, but to a lesser degree, the de jure right to work. So what are the implications of this? Well, they tell us something about the levels at which refugee rights are shaped and determined. So on the one hand, negotiating with the central government matters if you want to change things in law at the national level. But if you want to change things in practice, you arguably have to look a level down. You arguably have to, as international organizations, NGOs, also work with local authorities. You have to work at a sub-national level in order to produce outcomes related to refugee rights. Decentralization is not the only proxy variable you could use to explore those dynamics, but it highlights that countries with constitutional arrangements that delegate and de devolve significant authority are more likely to have policies at the local level that diverge from those at the national level, and that that's a significant opportunity for policy and practice. I'll now hand over to uh, Jakob, um, who can say something about his paper on refugee migration and the labor market, lessons from 40 years of post-arrival policies in Denmark. Thank you very much. And thank you for organizing this issue and this event. My paper here is joint work with H. and Koo and Kristen Tusman from UCL. And it's about the effect of post-arrival policies in high-income countries with a particular focus on how these policies affect labor market integration in the country. We know from other research that refugees have a relatively low labor market attachment in many high-income countries, even after several years in the country, and many countries are struggling with different policies to improve this. We focus on Denmark as a case study because Danish politicians have frequently changed policies and regulations concerning integration programs, providing an, for research purposes an ideal experiment a laboratory, and secondly, because Denmark provides excellent uh, administrative data uh, on over a large number of years. So we review the last 40 year, years of uh, Danish post-arrival policies, as well as 17 empirical causal studies of post-arrival policies on Danish data, and compare it to 18 studies of similar policies in other countries. And we focus on five types of policies, dispersal policies that allocate refugees within the country in proportion to inhabitants, employment, traditional employment support measures, language training, the level of welfare benefit generosity, and permanent residency regulations. Our main finding is that only two of these policies really generate long-term significant employment effects for the affected refugees. And that these policies are policies that do not disperse refugees in proportion to inhabitants and policies that provide skills investments in the form of language training. The Danish dispersal policy allocated refugees to areas with both high and low employment. And being placed in an area with low employment rates, it turns out, has a very substantial long term negative effect uh, for the refugees. The Danish language training program is very extensive, providing more than one year of full-time training, but it improves participation in education, so further skills investment and access to better jobs and produces earnings benefits 15 years after training completion. Traditional measures of empl employment support, like on-the-job training, produces only short-term employment effects. But we highlight a recent finding that it may crowd out time spent in language training. Denmark has reduced the level of welfare benefits that immigrants are eligible for on multiple occasions to provide a high incentive to work. The Danish studies find that these reductions raise employment by a substantial amount, but the effect vanishes after a few years. And because these benefit reductions generate an overall large income loss for the affected families, it produces massive unintended effects by pushing more women out of the labor force increasing crime rates for adults as well as their adolescent children who grow up in families with reduced benefits. Finally, uh, the last policy is the regulation of permanent residency and the one uh, 
a particular Danish reform has reduced uh, work uh, and a language requirement. And this uh, study of this reform finds that it reduced, uh, in contrast to the purpose of the policy, it reduced employment of affected refugees, particularly for low achieving individuals. So many of these findings are supported by international studies of, or in other countries. And our study highlighted a number of general points for policy evaluations of refugee policies. It is crucial to know both the short and long-term effects, to examine potential unintended effects, and that benefits, while ben policies may benefit some, it may do harm to others. In general, we find that incentive policies, such as the benefit reductions and permanency regulations, may not achieve their goal if the affected groups have very low skills or for which there is no demand. This may be a particular problem uh, when wages are bound by regulations so that the productivity of refugees may be below a minimum wage. In such countries, human capital investments may be crucial. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jakob. Um, next, we're gonna move on to Maria Jose who's going to present her paper with Sandra Rosso on who opposes refugees, Swedish demographics and attitudes towards forcibly displaced populations. So, okay, good evening to everyone. Um, my name is Maria Jose Urbin. I work with Sandra Rosso in the World Bank. So today I will summarize the paper who is again supporting refugees, individual demographics and attitudes toward forcibly displaced populations. Uh, with this paper, we wanted to identify the impacts of migration inflow on the support for immigration, and examine whether changes in attitudes toward immigration are heterogeneous based on individuals' characteristics and according to the economic trends experienced by each individual. The context of our story is the refugee placement program implemented in Sweden between 1985 and 1994. This program settled refugees quasi randomly in municipalities across Sweden. We use the, this variation induced by the program to estimate a to SLS specification. And we found a large and negative effects of migration inflows on people's support for immigration and found that these responses are driven by the changes in attitudes of young males with less wealth and who work in blue collar occupations. Also, we found more support, for more support for immigration in municipalities that experience higher changes in employment rates when refugees arrive, and in municipalities where the tax collection was lower, concurrent with the arrival of refugees. And in the, in the actual context, context with a record of almost 84 million first migrants by mid of 2021, Resentment towards these migrants is only expected to increase. In this context, this paper contributes to character, characterize to whom possible interventions to increase social cohesion between refugees and locals can be targeted more efficiently. And this is a short summary of our paper. Fantastic, thank you. That was beautifully concise. Um, and I think a wonderful complementarity between the papers telling us about um, policies that can work for labor market integration, um, practices that can work to potentially influence host community attitudes, and hopefully ways in which we can change um, policies and access to rights. We're now gonna come back to um, part two of, of the special issue that focuses on the link to um, the macro economy. And we're really privileged to be able to have Michael Clemens um, from CGD um, be able to talk to us about his paper on the economic and fiscal effects on the United States from reduced numbers of refugees and asylum seekers. So, Michael, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. The, the privilege is mine to learn from all of you of such uh, candle power on this issue. Uh, I'll just speak really uh, briefly. Refugees are people who seek protection, but they are also, uh, like all people, economic actors. They consume, they produce, they save, they invest, they found, they innovate, they pay various taxes, they receive various benefits. And through all of those channels, they have effects on the economies where they live. 
Now, those uh, economic effects are not at the forefront of ethical or legal discussions about refugees, but they, in the United States, at least they have been uh, very important to the political discussion about refugees. The previous U.S. administration pursued a, a very explicit uh, policy of refugee exclusion. Uh, the, the leading advisor to the, the president in the, in the previous administration uh, uh, stated the, the goal of actually excluding a uh, hundred percent of, of refugee uh, arrivals from the United States uh, before the pandemic succeeded in reducing refugee arrivals by seventy three percent, including the the dip in the pandemic reduced them by eighty six percent. So a really successful policy of refugee uh, exclusion. And during the the political debate around that policy, uh, the the economic and fiscal effects of refugees were often uh, invoked. Uh, very few facts were invoked, and in seeking to comment on the factual basis of those discussions, I found myself uh, uh, unable to find uh, clear quantitative estimates of the economic and fiscal impact of, of refugees, and that's why I wrote the note that's in this uh, this magnificent uh, special issue. So just a word about the, the findings there. As an economist, the, the very simplest uh, way to approach the question of, well, wh what uh, what is the uh, what is the value added to the presence of a refugee in, in an economy versus the absence of a refugee in an economy? The, the, first, uh, the first thing you'd want to look at is the, the wage paid to a, to a refugee worker. Uh, that uh, uh, somebody in the economy, in order to hire the refugee to do what they're doing, must be benefiting uh, at least that amount in order for it to be in their interest to pay that. So that's a good uh, uh, floor on the amount of money that... that uh, the, the the amount of value that they're adding to the economy. Uh, the next step beyond that is to consider uh, that even though the large majority of refugees, especially after arrival, are uh, are, are are laborers, uh, they're they're working for people who own capital. Uh, capital is combined with labor in order to produce output in an economy, and no capitalist is going to hire a refugee or any other worker for that matter unless they can earn a certain uh, return on their capital. In the United States economy, on, on average, that's about uh, 80 cents of capital income uh, per dollar of labor income earned across the whole, whole economy. So a, a, a rough lower bound on the amount of capital income that somebody must be getting in order to be paying wages to uh, employed uh, refugees uh, uh, might be, say, 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, the, the true value is, uh, is certainly higher than that, but that's a, that's a decent uh, lower bound. So with those... Uh, uh, very as just as a minimal uh, starting point uh, that gets you uh, quite accurate uh, figures are available from a study uh, from the Health and Human Services Department of the U.S. government. Um, the uh, the average uh, income of a of refugee, the vast majority of whom are are, are workers in the economy, uh, uh, selling their labor, is uh, is thirty thousand nine hundred and sixty two dollars per year per refugee. Now, notice that's that's not per employed refugee. That's that's per person employed or not uh, in the labor force or not, uh, man, woman, or child. Thirty thousand nine hundred sixty-two dollars uh, per missing refugee, of which uh, roughly ten thousand three hundred and ten dollars per person accrues to other people in the economy. Uh, uh, that is, uh, 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 people outside the the refugee uh, household. So. Uh, so, so is, is that a decent measure of the of the value added by by a refugee? Well, there are two big ways that that uh, that a that a connection between that number and overall value added could fall apart. Uh, the first is if uh, the the act of employing a refugee disemploys somebody else, so that the when a refugee is employed in an economy, uh, fewer other people uh, are employed. Uh, that has been uh, tested very carefully by Anna Maria Maida, Chris Parsons, and, and their co-authors, who got uh, decades of the, of the full universe data on uh, arrivals of refugees around uh, the, the US. Uh, refugees who arrive without family ties are essentially randomly allocated to districts. And that allows them to ask, well, when a, when a, a local area is randomly allocated to have uh, uh, more refugees than another uh, area uh, is randomly al allocated to get, what happens to the employment and, and wages of natives, uh, natives of different uh, ethnic groups, natives of different educational categories. They can't detect any labor market effects on any group of, of natives, uh, not the least skilled, uh, not Hispanics, uh, not Blacks, not anybody. 
uh, in the in the country. So a, a good uh, a, a, an accurate approximation would be that the employment of a refugee and the earning of the, the amounts I mentioned uh, earlier is, uh, is is strictly value added uh, to the economy. The second big way that this reasoning can fall apart is uh, is through fiscal transfers. Uh, even if a, a refugee adds a substantial value to the economy, uh, the, the the net economic effect on natives can be altered through uh, through taxing those natives in order to distribute benefits uh, to refugees. Uh, this also has been the subject of a, of a, 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 an extremely detailed uh, study on all of the refugees in, in the United States, measuring the net fiscal distribution, uh, net fiscal distribution to and from those refugees. Uh, including all taxes paid at all levels of government, uh, federal, state, and local, and exhaustively accounting for benefits paid to them, not just uh, resettlement assistance and and welfare payments and and those sorts of direct uh, cash transfers, but down to uh, very indirect fiscal costs like uh, uh, co congestion of uh, local police force time, uh, incarceration costs for the few of them that are, that are in jail, congestion of emergency rooms in hospitals, uh, every uh, every imaginable fiscal cost that you could attribute to a person in the U.S. economy. The balance of that uh, calculation is uh, positive $6.3 billion a year uh, uh, flowing uh, into the, the U.S. fiscus at all levels, uh, net of all of the money uh, uh, flowing out. And uh, that, uh, that, that figure is actually... Uh, uh, much lower than the than the, the the impact of the of the presence of refugees in the economy, which must account for the indirect uh, capital income that I mentioned earlier and taxation of that capital income. Correcting for that uh, omission, I estimate that uh, that each uh, each re each refugee present in the economy contributes uh, and or causes uh, 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 a, a a net inflow to public coffers at all levels of government of six thousand eight hundred forty four. Uh, dollars uh, per uh, per refugee per year. Now, to to conclude, what uh, from these uh, these uh, informed back of the envelope calculations? What sh should we conclude? Certainly not that refugees are any kind of economic growth strategy. If you total up the the number of refugees that are missing today from the U.S. economy due to the previous administration's refugee exclusion policy. It comes out to around 295,000 refugees that would be here but who are, are not. And multiplying that by the uh, by the the economic effect I mentioned, 31,000 dollars a year, that's nine billion dollars a year, or 0.04 percent of of the 20 trillion dollar U.S. economy. That's certainly not an effect of macroeconomic importance uh, whatsoever. Uh, rather, the takeaway is much different for me. The takeaway is that. Although in political discussions, our refugee policy uh, and our humanitarian policy is often portrayed as a, as a, as a difficult, uh, heart-wrenching trade-off between our natural inclination to altruism and our own uh, material needs. In, in fact, uh, those things uh, uh, are not at all in conflict in the United States. The admission of a refugee and the pursuit of our longstanding humanitarian policy uh, is a, a a positive investment in the size of the economy, in the in the in the specialization of the economy, and in the value of public coffers uh, going forward, and that's a, a critical fact that uh, that I hope will will in, uh, inform further discussions of this issue. Thank you so much for this chance. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, really exciting work, and to be able to quantify. Um, the economic contribution that, that refugees make and challenge the view that refugees are an inevitable cost or burden on receiving societies is, is really amazing and potentially impactful work. So thank you for presenting it so clearly. I'll now hand over to Carlos. Thank you, Alex. Let me put this on. Well, uh, first of all, as, as Alex did, I want to start by congratulating the uh, editorial members of the, of the uh, issue on, uh, of the, uh, and, the, and the journal on a very special uh, issue. I think one way of seeing how special this issue is for, for this topic of, of forced migration, uh, when I came in, I was talking with a doctoral student working on this topic, and she, at the, she looked at the list of papers and she said, I had to read every single paper in that list for, for my thesis. So I think that's how important 
uh, this list of papers is uh, for this topic uh, of forced migration and how complete uh, the issue is. I'm going to first uh, uh, say a few words about the papers uh, in part four, and then I'm going to invite the authors of these papers uh, to talk about their, their findings in their particular papers. Uh, the first paper that we're going to hear about is about internal displacement uh, in Colombia. And it's about lessons learned uh, from internal displacement. And I think there's, if there's one country that you can learn a lot about internal displacement, about what works, about what doesn't work, and what to do and what not to do is Colombia, that if you look at any ranking has the highest number of internal displaced people in the world. And this has been the case uh, for a long time. But now in a country that is ending a very long conflict, I think those uh, uh, insights that we get from this particular paper are very uh, unique. The second paper that we are going to hear about is about the Syrian refugee life story. And we know that if we want to explore issues of forced migration, especially economic issues related to forced migration, we need a long-term view. We need a longitudinal perspective. But the problem is that we lack a lot of data on, on forced migration that is longitudinal. And this is like a first look on a big effort uh, that is being put together to create more longitudinal data on forced migration, in particular in the case of, of Syrians. The third paper is about policy approaches, and I think it goes directly to the question of what works and what doesn't work in the case of uh, interior refugees, looking at the educational system, looking at different policies, uh, how the policy environment can decide whether refugees actually thrive in a country or whether they not. And to a large degree, it is a policy uh, decision. And the final paper um, is co-authored by, by Isabel and myself. And we are going to be talking about uh, return, uh, uh, refugee return. And sometimes we forget that a lot of refugees go back home, especially in different systems in which they are forced uh, to return to their home countries. Uh, at some point, the case that we are going to be talking about is about Burundians returning from, from Tanzania. And as Alex mentioned already, Tanzania is one of those countries that adopts harsh policy towards refugees. So these are people that were forced to return home. And we want to ask what happens when these people are back in their home countries. So for the first paper, I want to invite the, the, the authors uh, from Colombia. I think maybe Ana Maria is there? It's Andres, OK? So Andres, uh, please, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Carlos, and uh, thank you, Isabel and Simon for, for setting up this issue and this uh, special event. It's, it's our pleasure. And uh, and again, as, as Carlos mentioned, we're going to be focusing on the on the case of displacement, internal displacement in Colombia. And Carlos already mentioned why, why we do this. Colombia currently has 8.2 million internally displaced persons. This accounts to a little bit of under 18% of the population. Depending on the source that that uh, that we check, it's it's either the first or the second country with the highest number of uh, of displaced persons, and this and the protected conflict uh, in Colombia have a uh, kind of led a very comprehensive and, and and complete response by the government to protect the rights and promote the well being of displaced persons. Um, there's also a dearth of, of of evidence over 20 years of research on the dynamics, the consequences, the drivers of displacement, and also on the um, impact of different programs and policies. So we try to dig in and, and zoom in into the Colombian case with the hopes that uh, there's some key elements and some key lessons, as, as Carlos mentioned, that can be informative for other countries. Let me highlight a, a couple of a couple of, uh, of, uh, of main points from our review. The first one is that as, as the Colombian case uh, highlights, it's both possible and much needed to respond to the needs and protect the displaced population, even in fragile and conflict settings, even in, in countries where uh, conflict is still alive. Um, in Colombia, the first uh, policies that were implemented to protect IDPs were actually actually go back to the 1950s, after the episode of La Violencia, when the country implemented some policies to try to promote and, and, and support uh, displaced persons into going back into their homelands. More recently, starting in 1997 and going all the way back to 2011 with the Victims Law, the government created a very comprehensive and ambitious uh, set of policies and programs 
uh, and legislation to protect IDPs. So I think this highlights that this is possible, but it also highlights some difficulties in doing so. The, the laws were very ambitious. And along with the implementation issues and fiscal capacities, I think it was difficult to fulfill the expectations of the victims and try to support them into moving out of poverty and recovery. I think there's a question here that displaced in Colombia uh, have access to different social programs uh, with priority over the rest of the population because of the massive abuse of human rights. But there's a question in terms of how and when the displaced uh, uh, person circumstance or condition ends, when uh, they're able to recover and move out of poverty on their own. And I think uh, going into this direction, when we look into the data, we see that the displacement actually drives the population into poverty, and it creates this uh, this sense of a of a persistent and chronic poverty. Uh, when we look into the data, uh, actually recent data collected last year, we see that the rates of poverty among displaced persons are twenty five percent higher than in national average. And when we look into the research that we actually collected, uh, conducted with, with Ana Maria and Andrea some years before, we understand that this is not a, it's not a coincidence. Displacement actually drives the population into chronic poverty through different mechanisms. And if we take a step back theoretically, we can identify that displacement hinders and disrupts the capacities of the displaced persons. It disrupts economic, social, psychological capacities, and this can create a multidimensional poverty rates. So, so this highlights, um, um, it creates multidimensional poverty traps, sorry. So this I think highlights a lesson in terms of, of policy making. Of course, it's important to provide humanitarian assistance. Of course, it's important to uh, create these systems through which uh, displaced persons can access, access social protection, uh, uh, and safety nets, conditional cash transfers, education, health. But we need to push this boundary and try to understand which are the mechanisms through which we can actually promote and restore these capacities so that they can, they can create sustainable movements out of poverty. I think we highlight this uh, showing different uh, pieces of research. And finally, what we do is we try to do a, a comprehensive review of, of, of evidence and, and, and impact evaluations on access to services, vocational trainings, uh, education and health, and some uh, new psychosocial uh, programs to try to understand how these how these interventions actually try to create these capacities and how this can uh, lend themselves to creating these uh, movements out of poverty. So this is just a, a, a brief overview. Maybe just let me uh, end with a personal note. And I think this paper is also a testament to the work that was pioneered by Ana Maria, our co-author here. Uh, I was a research assistant for her back in 2004. Ana Maria was maybe the one of the first uh, people in, in Colombia and maybe worldwide start, starting to study the consequences, the dynamics of displacement. It, for sure, it, uh, it, uh, it was a great mentor and created this path in my avenue and research it personally. I know that it's also for Andrea Velasquez, but I think this paper is, is also a nice uh, testament to her work and uh, hopefully it draws these key lessons for other countries and, and to support the space populations worldwide. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Andres. And, and I also have to agree with the last point about Ana Marie Bañez, uh, her big role in, in this research. There were um, there was a lot of people, I guess, that were doing refugee stories already and were talking about economic issues, but there were not that many economists actually focusing from the economist's perspective on this in this issue. And certainly the work of Ana Maria also was the way I started uh, looking at this uh, particular topic. Now for the second uh, story about the Syrian refugee life story, I think we have uh, Emma. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to talk a bit about our paper, the Syrian refugee life study. Uh, this is joint work with several co-authors, uh, Sarah Stillman, Sandra Vozo, Abdurazak Tamim, Bailey Palmer, and Edward Miguel. It's very much been a team effort. Um, this paper serves to provide some descriptive, very early descriptive evidence on um, sort of this new rich survey that uh, we hope will provide longitudinal data on the lives of Syrian refugees who have lived in Jordan. And the idea is that we hope to track these individuals over time 
And this paper is simply providing a sort of first glance of that data from the very first round. And in order to try to um, kind of draw some conclusions about what sort of qualitatively the living standards that we're observing of these Syrian refugees are in this context, what we'll do is we'll actually compare the uh, sort of quality, so excuse me, the measures of the Syrian refugees outcomes to similar measures of Jordanians um, from a different survey, which actually Dr. Kraft, I think, will be talking about after me, uh, or at least this is a project that uh, Dr. Kraft has pioneered, the uh, Jordan Labor Market Panel Survey. And so we'll be using that survey to compare the Syrian refugees in our study to the Jordanian refugees, uh, excuse me, to the Jordanians um, surveyed in uh, the JLMPS. And I do want to mention here that this project of surveying Syrian refugees has been um, quite a collaborative effort with the UNHCR in Jordan, through whom we were actually able to draw a representative sample of Syrian refugees among the, the registered population. And we're quite excited that this allows us to um, have some early understanding of sort of from a representative level, how the Syrian refugees uh, in, in Jordan are faring and sort of be able to provide that to policymakers. So I'll just describe um, like three, three key highlights that jump out at us when doing this comparison of Syrian refugees to um, the Jordanians. But first there is one major caveat that I want to note which is that the uh, Jordanian survey that we'll be comparing to was conducted in 2016. And then our survey was done during 2020, throughout 2020. And so therefore it's impossible to rule out that these differences between the Jordanians in 2016 and the Syrians uh, in 2020 could of course be the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so for that reason, we're not in any way trying to assign or explain the, the reason that these differences came about but rather use that sort of Jordanian 2016 benchmark as a way to then identify particular dimensions along which the Syrian refugees um, may be lagging. And so as I said, there's sort of three, uh, three key pieces of data that I'll highlight here. There are many more in the paper, so I encourage you to, to check it out. Um, one, just looking at education, we see that among the Jordanian population, um, the average adult, adult has um, about 10.8 years of education, whereas the average Syrian adult only has nine. Um, likewise, if we look at food security, Jordanians, 63% uh, of Jordanians report having eaten three meals in an average day, whereas only 17% of Syrians uh, report that as being the case. And finally, um, just a third statistic that I'll, that I'll highlight is just looking at access to services. So for example, we can look at access to the electrical grid, which you might think is a bit less elastic to the events of the pandemic relative to some of the other outcomes I mentioned. And there we see that the Jordanians have 99% uh, access to the electrical grid, whereas Syrians um, are at, at around 91%. So these are just a couple of the sort of facts that we're able to pull out of these data. But um, as we sort of talk about in the paper, there are actually a host of really, I think, exciting outcomes, such as um, child outcomes, looking at strengths and difficulties, looking at uh, adult risk aversion, having detailed marriage and fertility histories. I mean, all of this is in the data, which uh, we will be making public and most a subset of which is actually already public. And so I would say that um, really one of the main goals of this paper is to raise awareness among the academic community as well as the policy maker community of this data set um, and what we hope will be a growing data set that we can contribute to every couple of years um, as, as we track these individuals. Um, myself and other members of our team are already sort of ex ex looking for opportunities to exploit or utilize rather um, different sort of rich components of this data set. And we think that there are a lot of opportunities to do that. So would very much encourage anyone to check us out on the Harvard Dataverse. As I said, a, a first subset of the data is already available. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Emma. I could see the eyes of some of the students opening when you mentioned that the data can be available for research uh, by, by different uh, people. And then for the next paper, which is about Lebanon and, and Jordan also, and, and, and you see looking at the policy environment, I think we have Caroline. Yes, uh, good afternoon from Minnesota here. I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this important uh, special issue and the, the panel discussion. 
This is some work I did with Bilal Malib and Saja Ozubi. We're talking about how do policy approaches affect refugee economic outcomes and insights from studies of Syrian refugees in Jordan and Lebanon. So refugees from Syria, 6.7 million um, as of 2020, are one of the largest populations of refugees globally. And Lebanon has one in eight people as a refugee, Jordan, one in 15 people as a refugee. So these are substantial refugee hosting contexts. Our paper reviews how different policy environments in Jordan and Lebanon have shaped economic outcomes for Syrian refugees. And the review summarizes key research First, on how to improve Syrian refugee economic outcomes, but we also secondarily examine the impacts of refugees on outcomes for Jordanians and Lebanese, those host communities, and how those may be mediated by policy as well. And I'll note, although I'm not talking particularly about the Jordan Labor Market Panel Survey that Emma alluded to, that is the data that underlies um, a lot of the, the studies I referenced uh, in Jordan and is also publicly available um, if students are interested from the Economic Research Forum. So what I'll do today is provide a little bit of detail on the education policy and labor market policy sides. Jordan and Lebanon took very different education policy approaches to the Syrian refugees, in part because Jordan had a well-developed public school system and Lebanon had much weaker state capacity and, and much less um, public education available um, at the time of the refugee uh, arrival. In Jordan, Syrian refugees were allowed to enroll in primary and secondary education through the public system since April 2012, so quite soon after uh, arrivals began, with fees waived. While enrollment priority was given to Jordanian students, Syrian students were able to enroll in shifts with capacity available, and second shifts and over time schools were added as needed. So in part, as a result of a relatively prompt and inclusive response, the enrollment of Syrian refugees in Jordan pretty quickly recovered to the levels that were in the same group of Syrian refugees pre-conflict. In fact, as of 2017-18, enrollment rates were nearly 99% for Syrian refugees aged 6 to 11 in Jordan. Importantly, the refugee influx did not negatively affect Jordanians' education outcomes, likely because class sizes did not change due to funding, including large amounts of international aid that helped support those additional classes, shifts, and schools. In contrast, in Lebanon, the Lebanese government did not initially guarantee access to public schools for Syrians, and international and local NGOs provided the limited primarily informal education opportunities initially. Over time, there was some progress. Um, Syrians in Lebanon were allowed into the public school system, but they had much lower enrollment rates than Syrians in Jordan, around 52% enrolled for children aged 6 to 14 in 2015-2016. That improved some in the years after until the Lebanese economic crisis, the port blast, COVID-19, and all those challenges um, dropped enrollment again. So I think the contrast between Lebanon and Jordan highlights the importance for refugee education of a concerted policy response and the state capacity to enroll all those children. On the employment front, neither country initially allowed Syrians to work legally. The Jordan Compact in 2016 extracted aid and trade concessions in exchange for increasing and creating all these work permits and reduced fees for Syrian refugees to work in certain sectors. The number of permits increased substantially, but take up was way less than hoped, and most Syrians who worked continued to be employed informally. Despite those challenges, those who did get work permits had higher wages, work stability and formality, and reduced risk of vulnerability. So the work permits potentially had some benefits there. In contrast, in Lebanon, Syrian labor had historically been a feature of the Lebanese labor market in terms of economic migrants. However, most of this labor was and continues to be informal and very precarious. So as a result, the two countries in the most recent data that overlapped had similar employment rates, but different working conditions. Importantly, again, providing work permits to Syrians in Jordan did not negatively affect Jordanians' labor market outcomes. So, those exposed to more Syrian refugees did not have worse outcomes in Jordan. Although this may be due to the aid and trade concessions that came with the Jordan Compact and the international aid generally, 
as well as Syrians potentially displacing other migrant groups such as Egyptian economic migrants. So I'll summarize the sort of two key takeaways we saw on these two fronts. Um, so the key takeaway on education policy is that countries can provide as good as pre-conflict education outcomes to refugees with a concerted policy effort, including sufficient resources. And the key takeaway I think on employment policy is that providing legal and decent work opportunities for refugees in this sort of developing country context is challenging, but it can help refugees and does not necessarily harm folks. So I'll end with those thoughts, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Caroline. And I think, that's, as I said at the beginning, to a large degree, I think the paper reflects the idea that if you have the right policies, actually, refugees can thrive in any country. <coughs> the last paper in this section is my paper with um, uh, Isabel. So I'm going to summarize that quickly, just give you the main you know, idea of the paper. And, and this is a paper that uh, was commissioned by the World Bank and it was part of a big collection of papers on, on, on forced migration and social cohesion that the bank was publishing at, at that time. And this one is in particularly looking at what happens when refugees return uh, home. And when we started looking at this question, of course, the first literature on social cohesion and you know these topics of conflict that we came across uh, basically said that when you have conflict, actually cooperation and social cohesions sometimes increase. Uh, in a particular uh, location, but actually it increases by what you would call in-group members. So people that are part of the same group actually become more cohesive, they cooperate more, but it doesn't happen with what you would call out-group uh, members. So our first instinct was to supply this to the case of forced migration, looking at you know groups that you would expect to be in-group members, so same ethnicity, the same, same other uh, similarities related to class, and then see how that will play out in the context of, of forced migration. But the one thing that then we, we discovered while doing that is that the forced migration process has an effect on identity creation. So people that might have been part of the same in-group before forced migration are not part of the same one anymore. So for instance, there was a lot of uh, uh, identity uh, in identification with the category of being, you know, a returnee. So people who, who left and were in another country together suddenly created their own identity. And people who stay behind, who have might have been divided by other lines uh, of identification or identity, suddenly those lines disappear uh, substantially. And what we were left with is essentially is with two important categories, one being a returnee, some people, some people that grew up abroad, went to school in another country, and then the people who stay uh, behind. And we uh, look uh, survey data that we have collected for, for Burundi uh, and that included this information. And the main finding regarding to social cohesion is that in this type of identity creation that we were missing, I think was largely missing from a lot of the literature, not from all, because of course some people uh, doing ethnographic work had uh, recognized this different identity creation, was to a large degree that in these cases return, uh, refugee return, had a negative effect on a lot of measures of social cohesion at the local level. Uh, for instance, um, we ask people about their feeling that community members help each other. We ask them about uh, uh, where you could borrow money for emergencies. Uh, we ask them about whether they thought the community uh, was peaceful. And when you look at those indicators in this context of uh, return migration, in this context in which uh, people in the case of Burundi, were in Tanzania, other harsh uh, conditions in, in, in Tanzania, the effects of return tend to be a negative, which is, a, we think, an additional concern and something to be thinking when we think about uh, return migration. So there's always a case that we think about return migration as the optimal policy, right? Because refugees are back home, but it can obviously, in a country that is very fragile, it can lead to different cycles of violence uh, later on. So that's our uh, contribution, and now I pass it on to Vlad. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone, for coming also for the uh, for organizing this fantastic event. Uh, I'll briefly speak about our paper uh, with uh, Nigel Mehdi and Elio De La Hea, my co-authors. Uh, the paper on Ukrainian forced uh, or internal displacement uh, originates from the project we've done together with the University of Birmingham and uh, a number of Ukrainian colleagues in 2016-18 called Ukraine's hidden tragedy, 
uh, uh, funded by the UK Arts and Humanities Church Council. Uh, during that project, we've collected a lot of uh, qualitative data by interviewing internal displaced people across Ukraine uh, that originate from to, well, from, from the Crimean Peninsula after the uh, Russian occupation in 2014, and also from Donetsk and Luhansk regions uh, that f fled to Ukraine, uh, other regions of Ukraine in 2014-15. Uh, during that project, we've, you know, by interviewing people, we've learned a lot, of course, a lot of horror stories, difficult emotional baggage that we all carry. Uh, I, as an incoming geographer, thought we maybe try to also contribute differently uh, to understanding uh, the, the direction of travel, so to speak, of internally displaced people by using qualitative, meth uh, quantitative methods. Uh, and what we've done is we tried to uh, play with the data that we got from the Ministry of Social Policy, uh, the Unified Register of IDPs for internally displaced people, uh, 1.2 million uh, data covering 1.2 million IDPs, uh, we've looked at individual characteristics of IDPs themselves, uh, building on the work that Carlos is and other people have done, looking at uh, sex, uh, male-female uh, distribution, looking at uh, whether they're working age or, or old age pensioners, and whether they're children or, or adults. We had those, that type of data. We had also data on their uh, destination, uh, 25 uh, non-occupied regions, of Ukraine and also their origin, whether they're from Crimea, Sebastopol, or Donetsk, or Luhansk regions. Um, on the individual specific uh, side of which IDPs, that's, that's the data we had. Um, we've looked at uh, and used a particular technique, gravity modeling, looking at the attraction and size of the destination regions. You know, to some extent, uh, the, the original paper, so this issue looked at how we could place better migrants towards a particular economic uh, destination. We looked at whether migrants, the forced, forced migrants themselves, looked at, at particular destinations as more attractive or not. And so we, we've looked at uh, a normal uh, gravity modeling uh, variables like distance, whether people travel longer or not, and uh, at higher distance or not. We've looked at uh, normal also gravity modeling variables as the size, economic size of the region, whether richer regions are more attractive uh, or not. Uh, we looked at the population size of the region, and, and then we've thrown in a few intriguing political or geopolitical variables as the, the political stance of the destination region, its voting patterns. And particularly, we use the sort of perceived pro Russian voting patterns as to see whether that, that plays a role or not, or what role does it play. And we, lose, we also use the ethnic linguistic composition of the destination region uh, using the uh, self-declared Russian as a mother tongue as one of the variables. So we play the individual level uh, characteristics of, of IDPs and also the, the, the destination characteristics of the regions that they ended up with between 2014 and, and the data is for 2017. So in the first sort of period before the Russian invasion full scale uh, on the 24th February 2022. So the just briefly the, the findings of the paper itself for the study is that the first and foremost, individual specific characteristics of IDPs are the most important variable in their, in their patterns of, 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 of fleeing. So, you know, old age pensioner, also a working age male, have drastically different behavior. Uh, second, we found that uh, people that uh, fled from a rel relatively quote unquote calm Crimea behaved in a more, more quote unquote normal way. They, they, had, they had chosen more richer regions and more favorable regions on economic grounds. Whereas people fleeing from the Donbass, the behavior was not, could not be explained by normal sort of economic uh, rational calculations. Uh, and finally, the second most important characteristic was, was actually politics. So people were driven to much more Ukrainian regions. So the regions that voted against Yanukovych in 2014, uh, 2010, sorry, uh, were much more attractive to the external displaced people. And also the regions that had fewer numbers of Russian as a mother tongue speakers also attracted the majority of the uh, internally displaced people. And from that, we've drawn four conclusions for policy 
some of it relevant for the current uh, crisis. Of course, individual specific characteristics of IDPs is important, and as well as refugees. So the current Ukraine composition of refugees abroad, 83% of women and children, and of course the policy should, should acknowledge that. Yeah, female related and children childcare related uh, activities are should be the you know the, the most important things um, that that um, host communities do. Also, because of the political the importance of politics, the protracted nature of displacement means that unless the situation at home changes dramatically and returns to what it was, people would not return home unless Ukrainian sovereignty is restored effectively. Um, and another two uh, set of policy implication is that when you're faced with indiscriminate violence of, of quite a normal scale, effectively you run as far as you can, and and that is, I mean, a normal normal sort of conclusion. But it is it is I think uh, supported by the data. And finally, we found that uh, we didn't find uh, the sort of the attractiveness or the, the public policy perceptions or the welcoming sort of of IDPs variable that's important. Uh, and, and so to some extent that throws in a lot of questions about welcoming of refugees and how refugees themselves perceive the welcoming or non-welcoming nations as well. Thank you. Yeah. And time. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Vlad. Um, I think we, we have a few minutes for some questions and um, either online or here. Um, I know we've presented you with a lot of information, a lot of papers. Uh, there's uh, cases of all over the world, but um, hopefully you found this interesting and yep. Do we need a microphone here? Yeah. Maybe for the nine people. I don't know. I like to read the question out, but don't know if you need one. Well, let, let me speak loudly then. Um, thank you all for, for the presentations. I think this is uh, such a rich uh, issue. I think there's a lot of really interesting work coming through here. I had um, one comment and one question. The comment was just, I thought the coherence of the messages around labor market effects um, linking what Alex was saying with um, what Mike Clements was saying about uh, the net fiscal or net economic effects of, uh, of um, forced migration, really powerful. And I think there's, a, there's an important kind of first order political and policy message that comes out of that. The more we learn about um, uh, labor market impacts, uh, I think that's really important. My second point is more a question on Carlos's paper. Because um, that's a very challenging uh, set of results that you're finding about the difficulty of return and the, the challenges of return. But you are focusing on quite an unusual um, case study, in a sense. It's return from a disruptive, hostile environment, institutionally hostile environment, to a pretty fragile society that is um, uh, challenged by issues of. of density of population, limitations in, in domestic economic opportunities, uh, deep uh, political tension. And I guess I'm interested in, if you take this, this work to a broader canvas, do you find similar sorts of results if you're looking at um, return populations to South Africa, for example, in, in uh, post, post the end of apartheid or um, in other post-conflict environments? You know, Mozambique, or indeed, we heard a lot from Colombia. Um, I think it, it's a really interesting research program. I'm completely ignorant about the, the scale of it, but it seems to me to be a really interesting area to explore further, the, the, uh, the challenges to return. Uh, thank you, Chris. I think that's, that's a very important question. I think our main conclusion, not looking only at that case, but other cases, is that there is a link between the experience of refugees in the other countries and what happens when they return uh, back home. So if you have returned refugees that were able to integrate into the labor market, were able to accumulate knowledge, were able to accumulate capital, and when they return back home, they bring all of that knowledge, all of that capital, all of that skills with them, of course, uh, you will expect them to integrate uh, very well. 
Uh, however, if in the contrary, you have people who are not able to integrate in the labor market, so potentially they even lost skills, so they came, you know, whatever skills they had uh, were lost, they were not able to accumulate any capital because they were not able to, to, to work at all. Uh, when they return home, and if they return home to a country that is basically, it's, it's a country that doesn't have the resources uh, uh, to maintain them, then uh, you have a problem. So I, I agree that I think the main lesson is what happens when refugees are abroad will have big implications for what happens when they return home. And of course, that's another reason potentially for thinking about these labor market policies in a way that is not only for what happens when they are there, if you want them to return home at some point, then that accumulation of skills and the accumulation of capital becomes essential. And I think there's uh, two particular papers that are fascinating in that regard. Uh, one by uh, Ricardo Hausman on, on re returnees to Albania, and one by Danny Bahar, who's one of our co-authors uh, well, authors in the, in the uh, issue as well, looking at former refugees uh, from Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia. And, um, and they both find that integration in the labor market in the host country does have good implications when going back and for precisely those reasons. I mean, in, in the case of the Yugoslavia, they, they were in Germany and they were working in Germany, in particular industry, car industry, and different industries. And they brought those industries back to their countries of origin when they were forced to return. So, but they were allowed to integrate, to gain that knowledge uh, in the other country. Let me jump in with, uh, with a question. I've got to ask Alex and Carlos as directors of two research centers here, but let me start with that. It's a very unfair question given the breadth of topics we've discussed, but for all the different issues we've talked about with forced migration, where do you see the kind of the most pressing need for policy relevant research, the kind of big burning question to feed into policy processes in this space? And maybe I'll ask Alex and Carlos if you want to come in, please do. I think. When we've got such a rich, diverse spectrum of papers, it's worth stepping back and asking where we are um, in the policy world and globally. Um, and I think we've got a point where refugee rights are severely challenged around the world. Uh, and we see that in a European context with the kinds of policies the UK government is adopting on um, removals to Rwanda, potentially to Belize and elsewhere, um, policies that the Danish government has adopted to try to be refugee free. Um, and we see that in low and middle income countries and regions as well, uh, a restriction on rights, um, the threat to close refugee camps in Kenya um, and elsewhere. We also see massively rising numbers of displaced people around the world, over 100 million, according to UNHCR figures. So I think it's worth taking a sobering step back and trying to situate research in that broader context. And so I think work that tries to explain variation in uh, the response of governments and host societies is really important. Um, how do we influence attitudes? How do we influence rights? How do we influence policies? But also I think work that tells us um, and evidences interventions that work, interventions that work for refugees outcomes, interventions that work to shape host community attitudes. And I think rather than sort of single out um, particular papers that I found really important and influential in this. I think that combination of explaining government behavior, explaining interventions, and trying to look at outcomes and what explains variation in the lived experience of displaced people, those different levels can work very effectively if we aspire to use research to change the opportunity structures available to displaced people. Could I propose something? If, 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 if there's time and I don't want to interrupt somebody else. Yeah. Yes, of course. Just, I, I, I really think uh, as somebody who's directly involved with lots of research and policy discussions, I, I, I wish there were orders of magnitude more research on the relationship between migration pathways for protection and other kinds of migration pathways. And, and here I'll use uh, th this uh, extremely fruitful uh, a concept of, of Alex's uh, uh, survival migrants, which I, I think Alex says is due to Michelle Fleming or, or something like that, but I, I, I think of it as a, as a concept of Alex's, that survival migrants are a large group of people of whom a subset uh, uh, fit within the existing pathways for protection that we have. 
And I think any realistic assessment of the vast gap between survival migration and, and the humanitarian protection pathways we have suggests that protection for the rest of survival migrants who fall outside that classification is going to need to arise through other kinds of migration pathways, through parole programs, through labor pathways, or sometimes through family pathways. And in, in so many political discussions, uh, even, even raising that issue uh, is, is somehow seen to undermine traditional humanitarian pathways. If you suggest that, that, uh, that for the 98% of Central Americans arriving at the Southwest border to the US who are not getting asylum, if you if you even suggest, as I do, that many of them could benefit from labor pathways uh, to the United States, and that the asylum system would benefit from uh, from other ways for those people to move, uh, many times uh, people in the humanitarian community see that as a, as an assault on the on the on the on the legitimacy of claims to protection uh, um, among those people, and I I I, I just. Uh, uh, I wish we understood far better uh, what happens to asylum systems when alternative pathways for people currently moving uh, through the asylum system are opened. Uh, what happens to uh, to people's ability to achieve protection when channels uh, for survival migration outside the traditional humanitarian system are opened? I think it's something that's going to be very important for this century and, and an area where uh, where we need a. Uh, 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 where we have some great uh, research, but we need uh, uh, many, many, uh, we need uh, volumes more than we've got. I, I think that, I mean, what Michael and Alex says is, is very good. I was just going to add a small note about something, an area where I think we need more research. And it's that a lot of times in forced migration, we think about the country of origin and the country of destination. So uh, the US in the example that, that Michael was uh, talking about, and, and I don't know, Honduras in Central America. But there's all these transit countries that people pass through. And I think more research is, is needed to understand what are the economic effects in those transit countries. And not only that, many of those transit countries, because of barriers to, to migration at the end, at the end destination that people have in mind, become actually uh, places of stay where they understand and there are maybe places that don't have already you know uh, an asylum system that is well developed that don't have clear policies about labor market potentially uh, uh, access of, of refugees uh, to these places I think that's one area that that should be um, uh, of emphasis in the future and it can also be true for uh, even internal migration right because people might have a destination in mind but you know you cross and there's a journey and you may stay in the journey. And even if you don't stay during the journey, you have experiences, right? You work around the journey. You have an economic impact. You might gain skills around that journey. Any last questions before we wrap up? Uh, uh, Vlad, I have a question for you. I, I, it's a question that somebody asked about you before, but I think it will be great for you to reflect. And, and somebody asked this before the presentation, what, what it means to do research in your own country of origin, and what it means to do research there under these circumstances, and how you know how how you approach that 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 that, that research agenda. Thank you. It's a difficult one, Carlos, because it's very. I, I, I mean, we're all different uh, academic human beings, and I think some of us are more. Uh, I, I presume people doing ethnographic research have skills and training how to to manage you know, emotional charge that you get from interviewing people who are, you know, find themselves in horrible circumstances. You know, some of us probably didn't have that training. So I found it quite, quite difficult to, to handle the qualitative data. Uh, and I thought I found refuge in the quantitative data because it's slightly more detached. I feel much more detached from, from the personal story. So I, th I think that for me, that was the, the survival strategy I'm afraid, uh, but it is uh, it, it is quite difficult given that uh, you know you find yourself also part of the of the whole process, having your your parents being now refugees, your your your, your brother and three kids being refugees in different countries, and you, and you and you now study them sort of and find you know those questions that we discussed previously, uh, find this this behavior of of, of forced migrants in a, in a particular way that that you you know you didn't find it when you you were doing it just as a research. It's, I think it's it's kind of 
it's a difficult process on one hand, but also quite enriching because you, you gain immediate sort of access to to the uh, to some of the things that probably you wouldn't get. So yes, better now than before. I think that's the answer. Thank you. It's probably important not to uh, for underestimate all the good you can do by continuing the research agenda. Just in the case of Colombia, for example, with Ana Maria and, and as you saw, uh, all the co-authors she has, which are previous students and and have been working on, on, on this area has contributed a lot to sort of policy responses. It's also critical mass, I think is important having two centers here. You know, I, I've, I've learned all of this through the conversation with Isabel and Carlos, the, the knowledge of, of the theoretical basis of, of the study. So, and not being able, you know, I think the critical mass is quite important to have a number of scholars who are working in a similar field Maybe not same same countries, maybe not some approaches, but a similar kind of topic. I think it is really one of the unique selling points that we have. Great. Well, thank you very much. And on that very positive note, uh, let me first thank our panelists for a really uh, fascinating discussion. Um, you don't have to clap this, but you can clap. <laughs> I want to take just one minute for a round of thanks. First, a huge thanks to our BSG and their team, including Sam in the box there, for a wonderful venue and a very, very smooth uh, uh, tech uh, set up this afternoon. Um, secondly, I would like to thank uh, all the editorial team of Oxrep, represented here by Chris, uh, and also Alison Gom, uh, who has made this issue possible. I want to thank all of you for coming along today, and those of you who joined uh, online. We really appreciate your interest. This is an ongoing issue and an ongoing discussion. We'd love to stay in touch um, in future. Um, on a personal note, let me thank Isabel. Isabel is far too modest to say this, but it's probably very obvious she's been the driving force behind this issue, and it's been a privilege to work with her. I learned so much about this uh, issue of forced migration through Isabel's uh, suggestions and wisdom on this issue. Um, and let me most importantly thank an absolutely fantastic set of authors for a really fascinating uh, set of papers on an issue that we all know is going to continue to be extremely relevant both for academic research and for policy into the future. Um, this is part of a discussion that continues, and we look forward to continuing that discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.